All right. So today we have Laura Myers on the podcast. Welcome, Laura. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to have you on the show because before we dive into what we're going to talk about today, I just want to let my audience know how you and I actually met. Mm -hmm. So Laura is a very close friend of mine, a dear colleague. So we actually started our careers in career development at the same day. And do you remember what was our first assignment? Do you want to share with my audience what was our first assignment? Yes, we had to um, set up for the career fair or graduate professional fair, one of those. Um, mm -hmm. Our really, really important job was to put tablecloths on probably like 200 tables. Um, yep. And uh, that's how we got to know each other because for hours, we just, hours. yeah, we're chatting the entire time. Yes. And so we, the grunt work, right? We had to do some of the grunt work. Yeah. So that was like our second day on the job as career development professionals. And we've come a long way. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, I want you to maybe share a little bit about yourself uh, and what you currently do, Laura. Sure. So, I mean, I'll share more about my story at the end, but I have been working in higher ed for the last, um, 18 years or so, and working specifically in career advising um, for 13 years. Um, and I've been at Northwestern University um, as a career advisor and an associate director there for the last like over 10 years, which never did I expect to be somewhere for so long, but I've been able to, you know, have a few title changes and, you know, expanded my um, work that I do there. And I absolutely love career advising. So I'm really excited to be able to talk about it today. And you're great at it too. Um, all right. So I thought that today we're doing more, it's like a career coaching, career coaches chat. It's a little bit informal, but I wanted to talk about some really important topics that I do hear from, you know, students and clients and, and really people that I know that I've connected with. And so we are basically going to be talking about a topic that I think will be valuable to two audiences and one are people who are starting off in their careers and they think that they need to go into their career field that there's one way and they i need to do this to get to why uh and then also people that are maybe in mid-career and they decide they want to do something else but sometimes they're like well is this too late for me uh i've already been doing you know marketing for 10 years or i've been in education for 10 years is it worth going into a different career path. So we're going to talk about how careers are not linear and how you can really design your own career. And so my first question for you, Laura, based on your, your years of wisdom and experience, um, what are some of the common misconceptions that, um, that you hear about in terms of finding the right career? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's interesting. I would even say that that phrase, the right career is so loaded because mm -hmm. There are so many career opportunities out there. Oftentimes I hear from whether it's young people or, you know, friends that they feel like, um, you know, I should have known if it's older people, I should have known earlier on what I wanted to do. Otherwise I wouldn't have wasted all this time. I hear, you know, I want to become this. So I know I have to do this, this, and this. Um, that they think there's just one way of getting there. I definitely hear like, well, if I start off here, there's gonna be no way I can ever get to this other place that I wanna be. I hear a lot of like nevers, can't happen, should um, mm -hmm. And so those are a lot of things that I hope I can help to like dispel today. Yeah, and I think sometimes people want a blueprint, right? Like if you wanna get to this, right. you need to do all these different things. Yeah, I would just add to, I mean, I work specifically with, I well, I work with graduate students. I work primarily with undergrads and also graduate students, but I will say, you know, I often hear there are some career, there are some careers, especially at the institution I work at that have a little bit more of a like clear cut path, which is not mm -hmm. most. And sure. my students I work with don't go into those industries. There is no one path for most of them. Yeah. So what would you advise for people that are kind of in this kind of mindset uh, in terms of how we can pave a career and that it's not necessarily 
laid out for us? Like, what should we be paying attention to? What, what are some clues or what should we be doing uh, in terms of thinking about how we view our careers? Yeah, well, I think it's really important to, first of all, especially if you're feeling like, you know, you want to make a change or if you're just trying, you know, even as a young professional um, to believe that it's possible. So I would say, I guess when we're thinking about maybe like mid-career professionals, for sure, because I feel like it's more challenging. Um, you know, if you're in a role now, um, maybe you have an idea of where you want to get to. Maybe you don't. You just know that you really don't like what you're doing. Um, I know you talk a lot about networking and connecting with people on this, but I have to mention it. Um, I know I've told you before, like I find networking to be very intimidating. I don't enjoy it. People think I'm extroverted. I'm really not <laughs> in that way, but I would say, so I like to just say connecting and talking with people. And something I tell my students all the time is that people like to talk about themselves and people like to help. I would say, I think that's true for 99% of people. And if you keep that in mind, like, like someone that you reach out to that never gets to talk about their job, probably be so excited to talk to you. Um, and, you know, having those conversations to start learning about, you know, okay, what does this actual career look like? And then being able to ask people that are doing those jobs, what advice do you have for me? Like, I feel like I don't, I don't know how to get to where I want to go. So I think that's just really important to mention, of course. I mean, and that's for young professionals as well, too, as they're doing more exploration you know, thinking about in your current role, you know, or in your current job, is there an opportunity to maybe expand beyond what you are currently doing or adding something really small? So even if that's like, I know you talk about like joining committees and things, professional development opportunities, um, you know, maybe you want to like work in public relations, let's say, and, and you need to really have strong communication skills and know your like social media and um, interpersonal skills. And so if you're, if there's even the tiniest way to add that to your work, if there's not, maybe there's a way, you know, to do that in a volunteer way. Maybe your office is like, let's do a office half marathon and, and you take on like planning, the, planning it and doing the social media for it. And, you know, those are skills that you are actually are acquiring and actually shows you being proactive. I talk about like if people have the opportunity to like volunteer in any way. I mean, I know everyone doesn't have that and families and lives are hard, but like um, if there's an, it, and again, all industries are different, but if there is a way that you can even volunteer for one hour a week, two hours a week doing something that is sort of like leading towards some other skill sets you're trying to gain for a new occupation, that's priceless. I, I, one thing that comes to mind with that in particular is because I work with a lot of alumni in like arts and entertainment, communication, fields, media, and, you know, and let's say arts administration, like cultural organizations, museums, um, music, there's only so many opportunities that exist, especially if you don't want to like, let's say leave Chicago or something or your city that you're in, which is how I was when I was looking for jobs. You know, a lot of the people that ended up getting their really great jobs now at the shed and at Ravinia, it's because they volunteered first. They were like a volunteer tour guide or a volunteer ticket taker or, you know, and then they were networking and making connections. So I think that's also just something I like to mention. Like experiences don't have to just come from your actual job. Do You know, experiences can come from so many different ways, even independently, like teaching yourself a new skill, you know, being proactive. Yeah, those are all great tips. I just want to kind of talk a little bit about some of the things that you just that you just said. So one thing, and I think it's the elephant in the room, is the networking and being intimidated by it. And I think we both are introverts and learning how to do it in an authentic way. Uh, and one of the things, like one of my secrets <laughs> that I always like to share with my students and with my clients is that you have to find something that works for you well, you do have to step out of your comfort zone. Like there, mm -hmm. definitely you do have to, you know, talk to people. However, one of my tips I always tell people is like when they're trying to gain experience, whether it's through volunteer work or joining a committee, that is networking. And mm -hmm. so for me, the way it works, I like to build meaningful relationships. So serving on a committee, being on a board, maybe volunteering at an event, then like you said, you are networking, you're building a presence, people are seeing your skills. But then the other thing as you were talking is that you don't fully commit to a career path, you're testing it out. 
So like you mentioned, public relations, maybe you, you are on a committee or you're volunteering and you're like, oh, maybe this is not for me. I don't enjoy this. Um, so dabbling, I think is really important and identifying the things that you don't like, uh, but then maybe discovering things that you do enjoy, but at the same time, you're building skills and you're getting to meet people in, in the field. Um, so I think those are all very valid uh, points that you just uh, made. Yeah. Can I add one thing? Totally. Go for it. I would say with the networking thing too, is it can also be like in a much more informal way. Mm. There will come a time where we get to like go to parties again and we get to like (laughs) be around people. And I would always encourage people like not to be shy about chatting with people and telling them, you know, what you might want to do because you never know who you might talk to. And I think those like organic natural conversations like happen way more than we think you're you're sitting on an airplane and chatting with someone I literally have heard this story before that from a student where they were chatting with this person they're like oh what do you want to what are you doing and then this person like oh well I work in this field yeah here's my card give me you just never you just never know and I know that's harder for introverts but you know to just feel like if you look at it like you were saying like being genuine will take you so far even in like outreaches if you're doing a more formal outreach I tell my students be genuine like be be yourself don't craft something that sounds so generic that anyone could write it like you know show your interest and yeah yeah it's a it's we're human and it's just building those connections and having you know being being confident in yourself and just talking to people and it's a two-way street I feel. Uh, And so no, I think those are that again, those are really good, good points. I was gonna say something and I totally lost my train of thought. I'll come back. I'll come back to it. I'm sure. Um, So when I guess thinking about careers and and people, you know, changing careers, what has been your experience in working with people that have completely shifted into a completely different industry? uh, Mm -hmm. And you know, just maybe any success stories or anything in your experience with people changing careers, is that common? I mean, I do know that people change jobs much more frequently than they ever did before. I think on average people have, it's around like 10 to 15 jobs. And I think it's actually important for people to hear. I mean, I just said I've been in my job for 10 years, but that's like unusual, I think. (laughs) Um, People really do move around. There used to be this stigma of like job hopping, but now people stay in jobs two to three years. I think four is like the average. Um, So I just think in general, that's important to know. In terms of completely changing, I don't know how common it is. However, I know that I know plenty of stories. And so I can definitely share. I think it falls into two different camps in some ways. So like there are some careers where people decide to make a career change and to do that might require them to go get some type of advanced degree, you know? And so, I mean, even for myself, though, I didn't go to graduate school right away, you know, in order to do what I wanted to do, which ultimately isn't even what I ended up doing, I had to get a graduate degree. So I think that's one, one area, but I like to think about what else, the other careers, you know, changers that didn't have to necessarily do that. Um, And so, you know, a story that comes to mind is a, a graduate student I worked with in higher ed, and she had basically just fallen into higher ed. She never wanted to work in higher ed. She, as an undergrad, had a liberal arts degree. She really didn't know what she wanted to do. She kind of came across this, like, just a temporary job at Northwestern. Um, It ended up turning into a full-time job, and uh, while she was there, she then got promoted into, like, an advising type of role, and she only had her undergraduate degree, but um, you know, she really didn't like it, wasn't passionate. Um, she did end up getting a master's in uh, communication while she was there, but still that's a very broad degree and she didn't know what she wanted to do. So I remember working with her. So after about eight years, she's like, I, I need to make a change and do something else. I mean, and the thing with her that I appreciated was like, she knew she basically wanted to work in a corporate environment. She didn't, mm. she was done with higher ed, but she had really didn't know what that looked like. Um, And I know she did some informational interviews and even went on interviews and she was looking at everything from like healthcare to startups to uh, consulting. And ultimately um, she ended up getting a job with like an architecture construction company, like so who knew Um, being a program manager there and she loves it. 
Um, she has since been promoted to a manager. And the thing I think about with her, as sometimes we think about like, well, uh, I've been in this other job forever. How's it, how am I ever gonna transition? Was that her, like the, her into it was that she was in charge of like um, education partnerships. So this company had, she had no experience. She didn't know anything about construction <laughs> or architecture, but her in actually was, not really her advance, her master's degree was really more that she had experience in higher ed. And now in her role, she has nothing to do with education partnerships. Another story I just want to mention and go uh, for it. <laughs> yes, is I know someone who in their mid to late 30s um, used to talk about, you know, how much they love food, love to cook, no connections to the restaurant industry of any kind. And he and his wife quit their corporate jobs. I think he was in software sales and started a food truck. And they started before the pandemic. And I, I don't, obviously it takes research and things to go into it, but they're like still thriving. They've made it through this. And so like, I mean, to me, that's like a complete ultimate change. And I think things like that, you have to really like have the passion and the, you know, gusto to do that, but it's possible. There's some risk taking uh, when, when doing, <laughs> yeah, when yeah, going for sure. a completion of a research, as you said, and and really following what it is that you you really want to do and explore. Mm -hmm. uh, Laura, so what what advice do you have for people that are mid career and they're thinking about a, a career pivot? Uh, I think it's important, obviously, to figure out like what do I need to get to do to where I want to go. So I think some of those things about what can is there something I can do in my current role that can help me develop the skills I need I'm really all about lately like independent like teaching yourself independent skills like things like LinkedIn learning um mm -hmm. I don't know you know I know some companies actually have that for their employees um so if not I know there's like they do free trials and there is a small cost to it per month but you can like let's say you were interested in you know learning you want to get into something more technical or like even something as like Google analytics or, you know, search engine optimization or animation, like not to say that like it replaces completely a degree, but to be able to show to someone like a potential employer, well, I am, you know, so motivated that I taught myself this at least basic intro skill and I'm so motivated to learn. I think another thing to think about too, with career changing is like, you may have to take a step backward. That's not always possible for everyone. But I also do feel like it's very possible to have advancement as well. So if you're willing to, you know, if you can do it to know that, like, I may have to kind of go backwards a little, but this is where I'm going to get to go and make sure that's known once you are in that, you know, position. Yeah. And one of the things that I wanted to mention, just kind of what you're saying is, um, building skills for sure. So using platforms like LinkedIn learning, or there's like edX and mm -hmm. Coursera. I don't know if that's yeah. how you say Coursera. <laughs> there yeah. are a lot of things like that to build the skill set. But also I think with career changers is also looking at their existing experience and how those skills can transfer into oh, yeah. a new, a new industry. Um, I know like I have a colleague who, you know, she works in advancement but her experience actually started out in fundraising for a nonprofit organization. And she was able to apply that skill set in advancement because that's what they, you know, well, that's part of what advancement does is the, is the fundraising piece. And so she was able to leverage that. Yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, that's just, I can't even believe I haven't talked about <laughs> transferable skills. I talk so much about transferable skills because one of the groups that I work with are music students and, um, people that maybe thought they were going to do performance or still maybe want to, but you know, those jobs are so hard to come by. So yeah. yes, transferable skills and being able to showcase them on your resume, showcase them when you're talking about yourself and networking in an interview are so important. I do have a good story to show with that, but it's so true. And I, I want to, uh, like reiterate that I know that it's true, even in my own office in terms of like when we have selected people to interview when someone maybe not might not seem as obvious as a candidate, but like is able to really show like their transferable skills. It's so impressive. Um, and so I think that's so important. The story that comes to mind was not too long ago was a woman again, she's probably in her late 30s. And um, she worked in a hospital setting as a communications manager. 
and really, you know, that's a very niche specific area. And yeah. she really wanted to get out of it and felt not confident about how to do that and wanted to make a pivot specifically kind of like the tech world. Um, and so, you know, we worked together to really think about her transferable skills. How do I best highlight this? Take the focus off of the industry and more about, I have these skills you need and how I can bring them to your industry. I just need to show you how. And it worked. Um, and she was successfully offered a position from her hospital setting to Squarespace. Um, yeah, and it was so inspiring. And, and so I do think that's important for people to hear, like, even if you think oh, I'm not the most obvious candidate, if you could show that, again, it's hard sometimes to think and you have to push yourself, but like, so if you could show that on paper and then be able to tell your story, um, a lot of times too, when you're switching industries, you're really excited and passionate. And I swear, I, you know, I, I say that's like half of getting a job that, I don't know, people want to hire people who are excited and obviously can show I can do this job and have that confidence. Yeah, I think that fit and personality and showing that that you are willing to learn and go the extra mile. And I think really owning your career story and being able to talk about it and what you've contributed and the skills that you have acquired over time. And for the career, the career changers, like I always like to say when they're like, oh, I'm starting from scratch, I'm starting all over again, but they're not. They bring a level of expertise and, and some of the soft skills that employers are looking for, like teamwork, you know, collaboration, um, adaptability, and oh. taking initiative, communication, like all those things, and how to be able to showcase that. I mean, the majority of job descriptions, if you really break them down, have these transferable soft yeah. skills. So I recently listened to this speaker who was formerly at Google and talked about that he does not like when people say, which I totally get it when it comes to like these skills, like he considers them like essential skills. Mm. So people like undervalue things like, you know, being organized or like being able to collaborate or being able to write or present. Like, um, so I've been saying that lately, like these are essential skills that every employer wants. Um, obviously like some jobs, you need some, you know, specific maybe things to the field, but there's a lot of things that can be learned even for more, you know, advanced positions. So, yeah, no, totally. Now this actually, I wanted to talk about another topic. Um, a lot of times people dive into a graduate program because they feel that it's going to give them a leg up or they're going to be more competitive. And while that can be true for many career industries. What are your thoughts on people saying like, okay, I'm going to get an MBA or I'm going to get this degree because, you know, I'll make more money. I'll be more marketable. Uh, what are your thoughts on the whole, like diving into a grad program? Yeah. I feel like I kind of have strong feelings. So I'm going to try not to be <laughs> too <laughs> bossy. Um, I, so yes, I would say that it's important to really know ahead of time that in many instances, getting that advanced degree is not always going to get you what do you think it's going to. So um, it's important to know before you dive into something, is this degree really valued by where I'm looking? Like, is this really going to make a difference? I mean, and a lot of times I hate to say it, but I would say the answer is is no. Um, I, I think I'm not saying not to get a master's degree. I think there can be really valuable things um, to take away from it. But I would say it's important to know that just getting an MBA, it may not change your job search at all, you know. Um, and, you know, I think there's other times where a master's degree really is something you have to have. So like even like in our profession, you, almost always you have to have a master's degree um, so it's important to do your research and understand that. Yeah. And I think that's where the informational interviews come in and actually conducting research and talking to people in the field and asking who's marketable. What are some of the trends? What are some employers looking for in your industry? So I know people have reached out to you and to me for informational interviews and they want to go into career development. And my master's degree is in higher education. What's your master's degree in? Mine is in counseling, community counseling. So I know I have met 
I've gone to career conferences and I've met so many people in our industry mm -hmm. that have all types of graduate degrees. Now, it, like you said, it is essential for us to have a graduate degree for our profession, um, or even like the, the example that I gave earlier about my colleague who was in fundraising and then she went into advancement. Sometimes in order to move up the career ladder, you do need an advanced degree. And that's you know something again that you would learn through doing your research and learning. The other thing I like to tell people is look at the job descriptions. What are they looking for? Are they looking for maybe a skill that you can get through a cert, even through a certification? But if you're looking at jobs that you are really interested in and you see that they're looking for a specific degree and it's essential, then of course, then that's you know obvious that you would need to pursue that. But I always say before diving into something, do your research, figure out if that's actually needed. But a graduate degree alone is not going to be enough. It, it comes with, with experience and, and other things. Um, so I really wanted to ask you that question because I get that question a lot. <laughs> yeah, I 100% agree. I mean, I think honestly, even a lot of times, like you were saying, like a certificate or like a, you know, a course in something that's very specific to what you want to do would be more valuable. Totally. Yeah. Um, okay. So I know we talked a lot and this is kind of, you know, a quick chat and we're just you know, just talking about ways to think about careers and that it's not always linear. And I know your career in particular was not linear at all. Uh, can you share your, uh, your career story? Can you give us a little insight yeah, on Laura I, Myers' background? <laughs> I will, and I'll try not to ramble, but um, I like to share my story because it's very windy. And I like to tell my students too, I just I say it probably on a daily basis. I had like a sophomore today that was saying, you know, they didn't know what area of marketing they wanted to go into. And I was like, I graduated college and didn't know what I wanted to do. <laughs> so, um, so I studied as an undergrad communication with a small focus in journalism. I did like some photography as an undergrad, but I really had no idea what I wanted to do. Truly, I graduated, um, you know, I know firsthand how hard it is to look for a job when you don't know what you want to do. And therefore took the first job that was offered to me, which was random, working like in an administrative role. But it's interesting because it was a staffing company, um, which I actually still have knowledge from sort of to what I do today, because it gave me inside knowledge of what like staffing kind of companies do. Um, I essentially worked three plus jobs in three years. Um, I obviously was like, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, after my first job, I truly was miserable. And I had the ability, I was obviously a young person at the time. Um, I was still at home. And I was like, I'm going to go work at Borders. And sadly, Borders are gone now. But <laughs> like, um, you don't know what Borders is. <laughs> I don't know, Borders, Barnes and Noble, Borders with a competition. I miss going to the bookstores. But anyway. <laughs> borders was known as the one you could like actually like just like <sighs> never buy anything and just read. The Hang books. out and have some coffee. Yeah, that was the problem. <laughs> but it was funny because I, before getting the job, I was like, I'm going to quit this job. and I'm going to go work at Borders. I didn't, I didn't have a job yet. And I went. To borders and I got a job at borders and um in the time I was there I think I was there about a year the interesting thing that happened was somebody went on maternity leave and she was the person that did the events and like the publication for the events for the store and so I was like I'll fill in for this um and you know during that time I was like oh wow this is probably more fulfilling than you know switching stations from like the barista <laughs> to the bookseller. Um, and I was really felt like, oh, I'm using my skill sets here. And then essentially she came back and they demoted me. So I thought that I don't think I can stay here much longer. But truly after that, I really just went from job to job trying to figure out like, what do I want to do? And essentially, you know, it came to me, like I said, probably a little bit after three years uh, that I, I wanted to have a job that felt meaningful to me. Um, I realized everybody's different, but I felt like I, I want to have something on a daily basis I go to that I feel is meaningful. So I decided to go back to, well, I didn't want to go to grad school. I like to be honest, I had no desire to get a master's degree, <laughs> but I realized what I was thinking of doing was something in counseling. I planned on thinking I was going to be a school counselor, like K through 12, something like that. Um, and so I didn't want to leave Chicago. So I basically applied to whatever counseling and social work programs were in the city. Um, I got accepted at Roosevelt University in their counseling program. 
Um, and, you know, the interesting thing there was, to be honest, my into higher ed before I ever knew I would work in higher ed was that my the admission counselor there said when, you know, she admitted me and she was like, do you want a job? Like, I'm looking for a grad assistant. And I was like, sure. So I quit my real job, which wow. I was like, yes. And again, I know I was living on my own at that time. So I wasn't, I mean, I was like barely getting by, but I took the job and um, I worked in the graduate admission office. So like I had, again, I'm thinking I'm going to work in a school setting. I'm going to be a school counselor, higher ed. I don't know anything about jobs in higher ed. So that was not even on my radar, but it's just interesting how things work out. So I did my program. I did internships and practicums in like community mental health. Um, the reason I went that route is because actually in the state of Illinois, when I was in grad school, you actually had to be a certified teacher to be a school counselor. And then I thought, oh my, that's like so much. I don't want to be a teacher. So I kind of, I thought wasted a year, not a year. It was only a semester, but I switched over to the community counseling program. They changed the, the law while I was in grad school that you didn't need it anymore. So it was like a lot of things, you know, a lot, I felt like, oh, oh my gosh, now I've just switched into this other master's. I thought I was going to do school, you know, it was a whole thing. And I was like, I'm just going to stick it out and stick with it. Um, and doing internships in mental health is very challenging. It's an important job. Mm -hmm. I realized as I got closer to ending my program, I don't know if I can do this the rest of my life. And um, there was a position that opened up as an academic advisor at Roosevelt. I was still working in the graduate admission office. So I decided I'll apply for it. I told my boss I'm applying for this. I was like, this is kind of like unofficial counseling. And then I essentially got it. So again, never planned on working in higher ed. I didn't know anything about it. Um, and then I did that job for probably about two and a half years. And there were certain things that I liked about it and th certain things that I just kind of got monotonous for me and I want to do something else. So I like to say that I applied I'm exaggerating only a little to every academic advising job in the city of Chicago. Cause I also, again, felt like I didn't want to leave Chicago mm -hmm. and maybe got one interview, didn't get it. And I applied on a whim to the career advisor job at UIC. And that's the job I ended up getting. Sure. So yeah. So, you know, it's a windy, it's a windy road. And I will say this, when I left UIC to go to Northwestern, mm -hmm. um, it was totally like a demotion in title, you know? So I remember thinking like, ooh, should I take this? Like, you know, um, I had an assistant director title. This was an internship specialist. And, um, you know, ultimately other factors played a role. Um, the reason, you know, I, in that instance, actually had met a woman at a conference from Northwestern and remembered her. So I reached out and let her know I was applying. So you networked. Um, networked. <laughs> and networked, even though I didn't want to, I did it. And I, to be honest, I reached out to her to just ask her questions because I really wasn't, I was like, am I overqualified for this? Is this something, I don't know, you know? And it is something also to learn too. I mean, higher ed is its own world as is, mm -hmm. you know, the corporate world. But um, ultimately it was the best thing I ever did, even though I was so, I was actually really kind of nervous to take it. I had a lot of life changes happening at that time. My son was only like a year and a half. Um, and so, yeah. And then the time I've been there, you know, I've been able to be promoted twice, which is exciting and why I've been there as long as I have, in addition to just like still loving what I do. That's awesome, Laura. And you know, one of the things that you just said, that I think it's really important is the job title. I think that sometimes people do get hung up by a job title and you just never know what's behind that. And it might actually be, uh, you know, it might not be a lateral move. It might actually be a higher position, but maybe, a, 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 a um, you know, it's just that the title can be deceiving. So I always tell people, ask questions, find out, because it might actually come with more responsibilities, especially if you come from like a smaller institution, it's a nonprofit you know, I, I went from a director to assistant di assistant director, but making a move to to UIC, I mean, that was huge for me. That really opened a lot of doors and and really paved my career. And and I love what I do. I think we both do. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think it sounds like I don't think either of us knew that this was going to be our career trajectory. And mm -hmm. we obviously both have very different experiences that led us to the same type of position. Uh, we have different graduate degrees, 
And so I think we just, um, you just, we just were able to tell our story. And like you said, bring that excitement and our transferable skills. And we've been able to grow within our, our roles and our organizations and, um, you know, just keep moving forward and learning. I feel like we can't stop learning. We always have to continue our professional development. That's key too, right? And getting these promotions and, and advancing. Oh, for sure. I think it's key. I think it's, it's key to be able to, um, take on things that maybe you might be scared to do. Um, maybe you feel outside of your comfort zone, but being able to say, yeah, you know what, I can do this. Um, challenge yourself in that way. I know that, you know, everyone talks about the imposter syndrome and I have it too. Um, and I've been in situations where I have felt really nervous to do things and been able to prove to myself that I can do it. And I also just want to say too, for people that are feeling though frustrated, like, um, who have been in a, in a career for a while that feel like, like they have wasted their time or like, yeah. what is this doing for me? And I know we touched on it with like the transferable skills, but I feel so strongly about really all of life experiences, including career. Most, you would not know though now how you feel if you hadn't experienced what you did from the past. It doesn't matter if you're in the job for two years, five years, 10 years, it's okay. Like it really never is too late. And no matter what, you learn what you don't like, what you do mm-hmm. like, you know. And so I think it's important not to look backwards and try to, you know, feel like regretful because you probably would have never known, you know, what you want to do now if you hadn't experienced what you did. No regrets. Moving forward and learning from those experiences to continue building and paving that winding road of, of a career. <laughs> I promise. It's a winding road. The more people I you think. talk to, you'll just hear like, it's a windy, like it's, it's for most people. It's just like, wait, what? Yes. <laughs> All right, Laura, thank you so much. This is so much fun. I love talking to other career professionals and just picking their brain and just having these conversations. And um, I think that people who listen to it will find it very beneficial All right. So we all know that you don't like to network, (laughs) but people are going to listen to this and be like that Laura Myers is awesome. What if people want to talk to you? Like, can someone reach out to you? (laughs) I don't mind if anybody reaches out to me. I'm very open. So (laughs) and even though I said, I don't use LinkedIn. Did I say that? I mean, I do use it. I don't use it like Liz uses it, but I do. So you are more than welcome to connect with me. It'd be helpful if you reminded me of, you know, if you listen to this and then I would happily chat with, with anyone, really, that's probably the best way. That's awesome. Thank you again. And you and I will continue to stay in touch. Uh, and thanks. Yeah. Thank you for having me.